Why do you believe the Rastafari view of Selassie differs so much from the Ethiopian and the historical view of Selassie? That's a great question about Haile Selassie. Um, so Haile Selassie, he, he, he gets the, the phrase name, his printing name was Ras Safari. And Ras being a princely you know, noble title, right? That's a title, not a name, proper name. Um, and so he comes to the throne in the early 20th century. This is during the, the sort of um, the height of European imperialism and colonization in Africa, but also in Asia and in other parts of the world. That's sort of the backdrop, right? And um, because, you know, people in the African diaspora, particularly in the Americas, are looking for, some people are looking for this sort of, of Messiah-like savior or, 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 or being that would provide some modicum of, of you know, liberation from the tyranny of, of, of you know, neo-European societies, whether the United States, Jamaica, or other, you know, colonies as they were. And so they look towards the Bible. And the Bible, of course, we can talk about this, you know, why, why that in another text. Because literacy came through the Bible for most enslaved and former enslaved people. That's how they learned read and write. And so the Bible is literary true um, because that was available. Uh, not because of anything inherently powerful or magnetic about the Bible, because it was just available. And so people um, in Island Jamaica, you know, began to essentially read or interpret those passages, you know, in, in that text about, you know, princes extending their arms to Ethiopia and reaching out. And also World War II was, World War One, excuse me, 1914 was, 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 was coming. And, and, um, you know, the, the place of Ethiopia was heightened, right, during the wars. Um, and particularly, so between World War I and World War II, um, particularly after World War I, when the League of Nations was formed, and last year, of course, you know, both League of Nations said, hey, you know, uh, we, we have to prevent another world war. And, and, and so Hale Slossi, you know, became a, a global sort of figure in that sense. And that called the attention of folks in Jamaica. Who began to send to build a, a certain you know feeling around about this figure called his Selassie. Short story shorter, you know that essentially led to you know what became the sort of Rastafari movement, right? Uh, built around sort of a deification of the his Selassie. Now, this is where the Bible um, again misleads because you see people say, well, the, the Bible is innocent and they, and, and people just misinterpret it. My argument is that these texts um, allow for the misinterpretation, allow for the or allow for the different interpretation, right? Um, and so, interpreting Hislasi as 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 this deified being, as essentially God on earth, right? The biblical text allows for that. So, it's, in other words, I don't see it as a misinterpretation. I see that, that it allows for that, right? And so, in doing so, you know, it built up. Hiris Lassi being a person who went to the bathroom, you know, who ate, who slept, who probably farted, you know, did all the human things that you and I uh, and others watching um, did and, and does into this sort of, you know, uh, immortal and perfect being, godlike, in fact, you know, in many ways, sort of you know, meta god, uh, beyond godlike being. But here's the problem with that. The problem with that is that people in Ethiopia, the people who lived with, and lived under his rule, see him as de a despotic. He was a cruel tyrant lunatic leader. And that's not according to me, that's according to the people in Ethiopia who lived under his rule, right? In fact, if you read Amharic and even English, because English became a language, because guess what? There's a fantasy that Ethiopia was never colonized. It was occupied by the Italians. And it was colonized without occupation. You know how it was colonized? The British had colonized it. That's why English became the second official language in Ethiopia, right? So this mythology says, A, Ethiopia is never colonized, and B, that Hislasi was this, this, this perfect being. Both of those are fictions, right? Yes, Ethiopia was colonized uh, through British influence, because guess what? It was the British who allowed Hislasi to come back from exile. They orchestrated that, because they didn't want the Italians and Mussolini in the north, in Sud what came Sudan, to come further south into Ethiopia right, to threaten their sphere of influence, right? And so it was geopolitics on the part of the British. And so Hillel Selassie was, was, was brought back 
because the British saw him as being useful as a tool to, for their imperial plans in East Africa, right? And that's part of the record. So the record in Ethiopia among the Ethiopian people in their memory, if you ask me today, about Eslasi, the real historical figure, not the mythology I deified one, and the one we should focus on, was a despotic tyrant individual who was hated in his own homeland, right? And so it's surprising to many people in Ethiopia who know this historical figure of Hale Selassie. When they, when they read about him, they meet Rastafari or people of that belief system in Ethiopia, uh, in Shashamunalan, or in other parts in, in the African world, right? Because they are, they, they are conflicted and astounded by how could one have this belief in a man that they lived with and knew, at least their parents lived with and knew, because he died in 74, lived with and knew and, and shared, you know, a, a life with, right? So the takeaway is that, you know, people in the African world have to, you know, dispel and dismiss and, and, and dissolve these dogmas because they can't lead anywhere. In other words, they can't provide a path of liberation because they are the impediment to liberation, the dogmas. And Rastafarianism is one of them. Now, some people argue, well, you know, reggae music and liberation. Yeah, that's cool. But you can have reggae music with, <laughs> without, without Rastafari. Bob Bolly didn't make reggae music, right? He added to it. It was Scott, it was Rocksteady, you know, <laughs> long before that. So um, I think we need to temper and I think we need to really rethink the dogmas that we consider to be liberatory. But in fact, they are the very uh, roadblocks to liberation. And I mean decolonization of mind, body, and spirit.